right. Okay. No, this is working great. So this is the plan for today. It's give you a little bit of context. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the process that we use for the simulation. We're going to give you two examples. Uh, one for Chinese, which is Green Ideas Inc., um, which actually is now Korean too. So we're using that for two languages. And the Master and Margarita talk, which is uh, the Russian version of the simulation, which we did with Green Mark. Uh, and then what? Whenever we talk about these two, we're going to talk a little bit about two design documents that you may find helpful. One of them is called the Simulation Blueprint, which is what we have used as an instructional design document to guide the design of the simulation. And the other one is the participant experience, so a little bit about how students perceived uh, the experience, and not just the students, but also the instructor, and there were three parties here. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So. <clears throat> How many of you know about the language flagship? <laughs> you two. <laughs> so, <laughs> two, three, four, okay. <laughs> so the language flagship program uh, is a national program. There is uh, 21 institutions of higher education. Brain Mart is part of it uh, that participate in this program. And what you see here in the map is the location of those institutions. Um, there is eight languages represented and there is three multi-institutional languages. One of them is Chinese, which is represented by eight or nine, uh, eight, eight institutions. Uh, Russian, I think is five or four? Or four. four. So then Arabic is five. Uh, and then there is uh, single institutional languages like Portuguese and uh, what's it called? Turkish. 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 Right. So um, within this context, uh, there is a technology innovation center, which is the center I direct. That is, uh, whose mission is to uh, help with the technology integration efforts. Uh, some of those efforts are discovery efforts, innovation, and some of those are integration. It's basically working with the different institutions, uh, trying to integrate technology in meaningful ways. It's a little bit similar to what you guys are doing with LACO. Uh, we are a little bit like a consortium of institutions. So, in, in the same context, we have some parallels. Um, then one thing that you need to know about the flagship is that it's a very innovative program in terms of language uh, studies. Uh, and the, uh, one of the characteristics of the program is that it's proficiency based. So that means that uh, having you know, a certain amount of years of uh, sitting in classrooms and approving classes doesn't really mean a lot. Uh, there is a proficiency bar. And that's uh, measured by an independent measure. It's not the institution, but it's an external measure. Uh, in our case, uh, the OPI, for example, is one of those measures. The oral uh, proficiency interview, right? Yeah, yeah OK. And, <laughs> and may I add, yes, the yeah. goal of the entire flagship program is to create those global professionals, so people who can work worldwide in a foreign language, right? So they are getting um, a major. They are economists, physicists, whatever um, they are interested in. Plus, they have a professional proficiency in a language. Exactly. Yep. So, proficiency based is one of the characteristics of the program. The other one uh, is uh, one one piece of the program is called the capstone year, uh, which is a very important part of it. The flagships have a lot of uh, study abroad experiences. In some cases, every year. And the capstone year is a year abroad where students do two things. They take, and correct me if Russian is different, because sometimes there's variation among the languages. They take unsheltered academic, they do unsheltered academic work, which means they're doing academic work with folks in classes that are not sheltered. They're not designed for them as non-native speakers of the language. Uh, they are for mainstream classes. And then there is an internship component that can be either working with the government institution or working with a private company. So the uh, capstone year is divided into two, typically, the first half of the year one, the other half of the year the other. And when they come back, they have the um, test, right? And that's what actually measures uh, how well they did. So um, within this context, um, what the Tech Center did as one of the projects that we have has been to try to work with different institutions and ways to support that capstone year experience. Um, and one of the things that we are doing is simulations. So if you take a look at the literature, simulation definitions are all over the place. And what you're going to find is that uh, they're, they're uh, huge in nursing, for example. 
um, they, there is a ton. If you're interested in the research, I would recommend going into the nursing part of it because there is a lot of research there. Uh, and also in aviation, uh, simulations are quite uh, common in that area. So uh, from our perspective, the second definition is where it would apply best. Uh, the idea of that it is a technique, uh, a pedagogical tool, let's say, uh, to replace or amplify real experiences with guided experiences. The guided part being a very important part because it's it's you know helping people go through an experience before they go to the actual experience. Um, so in this context, uh, within language instruction, simulations have a lot of benefits that we can think about. One of them is that they can be very useful to implement blended learning um, because it's one interesting way to incorporate uses of technology with classroom work. Um, so it's it, it can help a lot in that way. It gives a lot of context for a blended learning experience, which is something that is uh, a, a good thing. Uh, they create opportunities for highly contextualized language used. Uh, you're gonna hear a little bit more about that. And then opportunities to address interpersonal communication skills, at least in the case of our simulations, uh, the simulation is uh, moved forward by people behind the scenes. So it's not a simulated experience in the sense that everything is automated. Uh, there are people who are actually enacting the simulation. Um, and then there is also opportunities to address 21st century skills, which are the tough ones. Like how do you write a good email to a colleague that is a professional email and things like that. So those are skills that sometimes even in the native language students don't have. So it's a really good thing to, to have those. So going back to how we design the whole experience, uh, the way we have approached simulations has been very similar for all three. So we started out by thinking about the learner experience, not the technology, it's just what the learners would go through. So in thinking about the learner experience, what we did was create a vignette first. And this vignette basically describes, all oh, this is available online by the way, so if you would like to see, it was not intended for you to read it. <laughs> it's, just, yeah, it's, a, it's online, it's just to show you what it looks like. And, uh, so the, the vignette is super useful for us. All these are comments, sometimes the not technology comments or pedagogical comments, why things are being done in a certain way. And the vignette basically tells you the story of, a, of, of one person who goes through the simulation and how that works. So this is a wonderful way to uh, kind of think, start thinking about how this would work uh, in the student's shoes, right? Like the, the actual people who will go through the simulation. The uh, other uh, design document that we use is called a simulation blueprint, and this we designed keeping in mind that we needed at least four moving parts to be aligned. So it helps a lot to think about these four things that you see in the middle within the context of the first thing, which is the expected outcomes. So that's that's where we start. Uh, we we start out. Okay, what would you like? What would we like students to do? Uh, what would like what would we like them to experience? Then. We think about the focus tasks that will help us achieve those goals, that overarching goal, um, the materials and communication tools that will be used. Um, it's, it's good to think about these parts, um, you know, focus on these parts one at a time. In the, the materials and communication tools, for example, we, we have discussions such as how can we make this more realistic? Uh, for example, if we're using uh, a communication tool for a Chinese simulation, it makes sense for the students to use something that is used in China, not Facebook or something that is banned in China, right? So we do things, we integrate technologies and tools that make sense for that context. Then the participant activities, participants' activities and roles, uh, which are also uh, good to think about. In our case, uh, we have at least three different constituents in the simulation. We have the, the staff from the tech center, then there is the instructor, and then there are the students. And the, the three work, you know, doing, uh, contributing to, to how the simulation works. So it helps to have those roles um, sorted out. One role that we have in the Chinese simulation is community members who come uh, to see presentations and evaluate the students and also interview students. Uh, then the rules and implementation strategies. So basically, we try to describe how the rules are going to work. Um, th at the beginning, this sounds straightforward, but when you start thinking about it, it's a little bit complicated. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, 
but rules, for example, for the Chinese simulation, you can apply only once for only one job and things like that, which make things a little bit clearer to the students, so they know what to expect. So uh, this is basically a description of the process we went through. The simulation for uh, Chinese is basically based on uh, a company, a fictitious company that we created. Um, it's called Green Ideas. The purpose of the company is to help other companies to become greener. So, for example, if uh, I think one of one example was Tesla wanted to open a, um, a, a branch in China in Beijing, and the task was to provide advice as to how Tesla could do that in a green, efficient way. So that gives us a big umbrella topic that we can help students go in their area of professional interest. So for example, if you're interested in law, like Irina said, some students are not necessarily just language majors, they are also working on other tracks. So if you're interested in law and you're doing Chinese, then this problem fits well in your context because you have to figure out the legal aspects of Tesla opening a plant in China. So uh, we, we give um, students the opportunity to actually use the type of language that they will be using in the real world in their own profession. So we have, for Chinese, we have two uh, modules, uh, the application module and the teamwork module. These happen in a semester. And what you see here is basically key tasks that happen during the implementation of the simulation. So I'll give you just a very brief overview of each of these. For the application module, Basically, there is a whole company website that we created where you find jobs. We first interview students to find out, uh, well, actually survey, not interview. We survey students to find out what it is that they're interested in. Sometimes we can know that through the instructors. And then we design jobs that we think they will appeal to them. So if you're in law, for example, and you are in Chinese, there's going to be a job there for you that has to do with law and um, you, you you know, you will find relevant to what you're doing. So uh, one of the first tasks then is for students to go and explore the website and prepare because they're going to be applying for a job there and then they're going to have an interview. So the second step is to submit an application and this is this part is done in a blended way. Uh, we I think we ask instructors to do at least one class where they spend time talking about the cover letter and the uh, CV. This has been incredibly helpful because some students don't even have a CV in English and they all of a sudden they have to create one in Chinese. So uh, it's an eye opener and it, it helps. That's what we get from their feedback that it's a really good experience to go through. Uh, uh, besides that, not only they don't have a resume in English, but they have no clue how to do that culturally uh, you know, uh, well in the target language. So, uh, well, the, the instructional design document that we have is a, basically a rubric that we share with instructors so instructors can get feedback. So then uh, students go through this process of creating and revising their application, submitting it, uh, and then they have interviews with people they don't know. Basically, the tech center carries out those interviews through Skype. Uh, and we invite people from the community to help us in this task. And the people from the community, you know, come up with a couple of questions from the company website. Uh, and then during the interview, students have to interact with people they have never met. It's very, very much a simulated, very real simulated experience. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the idea for the Chinese simulation. The next one is a simulation we did for Russian and Irina. I think you start with this one. Yes. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so we only ran the simulation once. We ran it this spring. So it is still fresh and it needs some work. But um, it was already a great experience for all three parties involved the students, the instructor, and the tech set of the tech support. What a project. So it was an existing course that I developed during winter break to teach um, reading Master and Margarita in Russian. And um, it's a 400 page long novel. Um, I had six juniors in the flagship program, so very proficient, read this very proficient speakers. Um, 
And um, as part of this course, I had the final presentations and final papers as in any general content-based course. Um, and of course, I was not completely um, happy with that because I did that a million times, so I was ready for something new. So in February, so when semester already started, the tech center contacted uh, all the flagship campuses saying that they would like to do some uh, blended learning pilots with us. And I thought this is a great way to introduce some blended learning into my course um, by changing the presentation and paper components into an opportunity for blended learning. So um, in the next month, we developed the whole simulation. And then from after spring break, we, we run it until the end of the semester with students presenting at the end of the semester. It was very, very quick. Um, we came up with two vignettes, um, one to simulate a TEDx event and another to simulate an academic conference. Both of them would be open to the public. As Julio said, this is one of the components, right? This, is, this has to come out of the classroom into the broader world. And students unanimously chose um, the academic conference, which makes sense because they signed up for a, a master of art course, which is um, a library test. Um, uh, so they chose the vignette. And then all the work started for us. Um, the Tech Center developed the website for the conference. We called it the Master and Margarita Talk. Um, and then the students had to go through all of the stages of preparation for an academic <coughs> conference. So they had to submit their conference proposals. They um, got feedback from the conference organizers, from the Tech Center and me, um, about their conference proposals. They revised the proposals and submitted them again. We accepted their proposals, we accepted them into the conference, and posted their proposals on the conference website. Then they prepared for the presentation, and then they gave the presentation to the public. And the public was the TRICO community, um, and also via Zoom, other flagship communities. Um, to prepare to write a proposal, to prepare to make a presentation better, they they ran some less. They had some lessons to prepare for that, and um, this is just the same thing. And then lessons. Yeah, I can talk briefly about the participants' experience. We're running out of time, so uh, basically, this is a summary of what uh, Irina has just mentioned. Uh, uh, divided by weeks, uh, so uh, I'll just go week by week. Uh, during the first week, uh, the participants had to explore the website and complete lesson one, which was about how to write an abstract, how to write a proposal in Russian. And then they started drafting the proposal. Uh, during week two, they had to submit their proposal and complete lesson two, which was about how to structure your presentation at a conference. In week three, they had to uh, revise the proposal based on the feedback that we provided to the students. Uh, in week four, they finished the revisions and submitted the revised proposal, and the proposals were posted on the website. And during week five, they had to do lesson three, uh, which was to um, help them um, learn how to ask and answer questions in Russian during the conference. Or oh, can I interrupt yep. here? So um, we were prepared that preparing them to uh, present to interact during a conference <coughs> and to formally write, right? So formal, formal writing, presentational speaking, and interpersonal speaking to, in an academic setting. That's why we included the question asking into the lessons. Right. And then uh, during the penultimate week, they had to do uh, the last lesson, which was to help them uh, practice the beginning of the presentation, because that's usually the most difficult part. And they also had to rehearse, rehearse their presentations. And for that, we used Extempore, which is a, a tool uh, for uh, recording and giving feedback on extemporaneous speech. And during uh, week seven, we gave uh, we had an actual event, which was um, uh, both on-site and online. Uh, students gave 15-minute uh, presentations, and they had questions from the audience that they had to respond to. Um, so I will let uh, Irina talk about the 
um, benefits for instructors and students and the lessons that we learned? Yes. Um, so for students, they definitely enhance their presentational speaking, presentational writing, interpersonal speaking in the context, but they also worked on their reading and listening through the lessons because um, also we need to say that part of the lessons were um, this h 5 e video things where um, students watched the video and went through assignments while they were watching the video. Comprehension questions, multiple choice questions, all kinds of things that they did there. Um, so they, they did work on their language, but I think the two most important things that they got away from the whole experience is that um, it was um, their comfort zone expander. I think the most difficult part for the students and the most exciting part for the students was to speak in front of an audience, especially an audience that they did not see. This is much easier than, as you all know, if you participate in a webinar, that speaking into the abyss is much harder than speaking to people who are alive and reacting to interesting. Um, and then um, another thing is that um, after the conference was over, they came up to me and said, this felt that like a real conference. And this is exactly what we were going for with this experience. So that's another great benefit for them. One huge um, issue that we all need to think about if we're doing simulations is it's a great investment of time between developing the lessons, finding content for the lessons, finding the right tool to develop the lessons, because the technological possibilities are absolutely endless. And to choose the right things is Time. And I'm speaking for all of us in, in that. Um, also, communicating between the tech center and me and the students, that takes time. Um, making it easy and accessible to the students, um, making them understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what they're getting out of it, is another time investment. And this is probably the only investment that happens in class. So we were talking about administering the project in class. But the rest of the work was outside of class, um, which is great. Um, uh, so that's um, one benefit from right, the all, basically all of the all of the project took um, place outside of class. Also, um, because the project grew out of an existing syllabus, it was so integrated in the syllabus that this, it, it felt very natural and easy to follow for all of us. It made sense for this for this class. Um, and of course, it was professional development for me because I learned so much about blended learning while I was there. Oh, we'll probably skip this, right? Um, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to do questions now or later. I think we'll hold after it the, after both okay, days. let's do that. Thank you so much.